Hey, Talver. How you doing? Oh, I'm fine. Good, good. I was gonna do a screen share right real quick of the uh, just a minute of the pop up research station um, that I do before people log on. So just give me a quick second. I'm glad you're here early. <clears throat> you got your hair wrapped up this time. <laughs> Pardon me? I said, I see you got a nice head wrap on this time. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I still, I did my hair, but it didn't turn out. I tried some new stuff and girl, so I got to go back to my regular stuff. I'll probably do it this weekend. It didn't work. Just a minute. Yeah, I was working on a document, and the next thing I know, it's time to log on. I know. <laughs> Today we're going to do like a um, professional development training. Um, I don't know what's happening here. Okay. Be right back. <clears throat> <clears throat> Your um You know, I got um, a painting or a drawing uh, from Deborah Soda. From who? From Deborah Soda. Uh -huh. Yeah, I haven't opened it. Where was it sent from? It was sent from um, San Antonio, Texas. Oh, okay. That's from Liz Gomez. Her mother sent it for her. She's in oh. Spain right now. Oh, is she? Mm -hmm. I talked to her last week. Wonderful. And, um, mm -hmm. So she was uh, going to send a large piece and then she read the instructions. Uh-huh. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like we were like, and the cost of that would have been like, she was sending a 336 by 48 inch. Oh, piece. no. And a then um, I, and it was $358 to ship it one way from Texas to Sacramento. And then so I sent her an email like the work is supposed to be on paper and the dimensions. And she said she apologized for not reading it. But so this piece is the, the piece that she sent you is what the large piece was. Oh, OK. Well, I got it here. Good, great. So um, I'm just going to gather all of them up. And um, I started um, gathering some frames. I'm going to go today and get some more. Um, Your um somebody's um needs a battery in there. I can hear your smoke alarm or something. Oh my um did 
you know, they were asking about how you were paid as an artist, you know, was it, you know, they asked about negotiating contracts and skills that you needed to kind of stay afloat. And did you have access to health insurance? And, but they wanted to know, did you have access to this before COVID? And did you have more access during COVID? And um, uh, what else? Um, mostly that it, it, it kind of was, um, you know, did you get support, you know, unemployment, um, et cetera. So I think you're going to have some interesting data about coming out about artists. I don't know how long that takes, but, um, it, it provoked in me a way of surveying artists as far as what their needs are, as far as technical assistance or, um, you know, do they have access to the resources they need in order to achieve their goals um, as an artist? So it took a, a long time to fill out the survey too. You know, they kind of give you those little percentage <laughs> as you go along. So, um, that part was encouraging. Yeah, it took, it took what, chat? about 20? Yeah, I'll, I was looking to grab the link, I'll put it in the chat. It took about 20, 25 minutes. <laughs> they had a moment in the middle where they had this visual that was kind of like an opening uh, image design and it was like, breathe in, breathe out. <laughs> Just like, take your time, right. it's okay, it's almost done. <laughs> right. I'll put the link in the chat if anybody wants to do it. So I, after we talked this morning, Alpha, I logged into NEA to see about workspaces and, and how to go the next step. And I tell you, it's a year since I applied for NEA and I'm kind of like, I got the first step, but how do you get to two and three and four? I don't know. I'm, I'm, already, I'm, I'm already there. Um, I had went in and they revamped their whole, um, website and the workspace and all that. So I had to up, um, go back in, redo everything, reload up everything and reorientate myself to that website. Um, and myself and Daphne, we did a whole walkthrough. Um, and, and then, um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and they were trying to eliminate, um, the make, trying to make it easier, but at the same time you have to go back in and just relearn the whole thing. Yeah, you know, and I did that a few months back. Um, and then recent last week, February 3rd, if I hadn't have went in, they were sending me these notices that I needed, I would have been invited to be a user on another account. And I didn't ignore it, but I was like, okay, I, I had to shift the gear to get, to be able to go in, open, get back in, reset passwords and all that kind of stuff. But I was yeah. always going in and being a user under the director of the museum instead of me directly so I could just get work done. Um, right. But yeah, it's more than a notion, I guess. And now they're asking on different, even with the Illinois Arts Council, they're asking for the, it's a, it's a code that the uh, SAMS gives you beyond mm -hmm. your DUNS number that you need to list on your applications. So you have and they're to changing. And have and change and they're, and and they're so getting rid of the DUNS number and they're changing it to some other system. You I e something, six. yeah. I got past that. Now I don't know how to how to submit the grant. It's kind of, <laughs> yeah, that's so, another hour webinar to watch, right? Yeah. yeah. It's a UBI number. It's a, a UBI number that they give you right um, on that on on that uh, site. Right. right. I got past that. Uh -huh. Has anyone ever had trouble with um, resetting your password on there? Cause I attempted to do it, then it locked me out and it was just, I still can't get it's it. It's the browser. Oh, should I use Chrome? Yes, I use Chrome, but when I get locked out like that, I have to go into Edge. Cause I called and uh, called in, I always call in for tech support. Uh -huh. That's what okay. they're, they're there for. And then they okay. said, well, the problem is your, your, you have to clear your browser. 
um, because it's keeping reading their old um, password. Right. Yeah. Right. Oh, I see. Because I don't use Chrome, but I was thinking if I did, it won't. So it wouldn't, wouldn't a new browser won't have that memory, in other words. Is that right. I got right. it. Okay. You get in and work. Thank you, because I was about to yell at the computer. <laughs> I was like, okay, let me do something else. They they make you change your password every six months. So it's or some incredibly, you know. Constant thing, yeah. Yeah. And you know our friend Rod Joy now is the, um, at NEA. Yeah. yeah. He's the assistant commissioner or some Manage. That's awesome. It's pretty, yeah. Um, yeah. I'm going like, I remember when he came by the Bronzeville Artist Loft and I served him breakfast. <laughs> you said, I remember when. <laughs> yeah, I remember when, you know. So, yeah, it's, it's real cool when you see your friends, you know, in high places doing great things. He used to tickle me because when he would take you out to talk, he would have his little nameplate and put it in front of himself. And he was so formal. Yeah, back in the day, day, I think when it was the Illinois Arts Alliance, yeah. right? Real cool. We used to come by there, you know, for Gallagher Gashard and come through for the workshops or come uh, when we first started opening uh, down in the new, you know, on 47th Street. He would just because they were living there on uh, King Drive, yeah, and they would come over just to check things out and, and everything like that uh, to support the you know, gallery. You know, mm -hmm. and one time I, I accidentally locked myself out. I was event managing and I locked myself out of the gallery because somebody put the thing on the door so it slams automatically. And before you could just leave it open. And <laughs> so all these people were coming, you know, for this big, you know, like workshop. And uh, the, the caterer came for the breakfast and everything. And we were locked out of the gallery. And, you know, we had, we had called one of the artists, uh, Roger Carter, to come bring the key, you know, over there. Because uh, we didn't have a lockbox at the time. My keys were inside the gallery. So it was kind of like, all right, so you guys got to come upstairs on the second floor and have breakfast in the loft upstairs, you know. And then we finally got the, it open. But, you know, it was, you know, it's just cool when people visit your space and hang out and, you know, they mm -hmm. become artists within your spaces so that that was really cool but you know but just to you know see how he was uh went from what is it the cause when he left the illinois arts uh, alliance he went to um the change state. illinois yeah state yeah so it was really cool all right all right so um what time is it lisa i posted a um i know we're doing these um I posted a link last night of your presentation. Okay. Um, I don't think I could share because I gave, no, I can share. Oh, I have it. I have it all. If, as long as you give me access, that's what I was doing when you probably didn't see me. No, just, I should, I'm sharing this. Yeah, so I can just put it up. Okay. I've Great. been playing, so let's hope it all works. Okay, cool. I did that article on, on blog about Lisa last night just so that it's on our on the blog and we're archiving your conversation so i hope that's a okay. good picture of you um <laughs> i was trying to uh I, I pulled it down but i was trying to do the other one that you usually use as a headshot <laughs> but this one right here is from the the library right oh i have no clue can you see the uh powerpoint i can't see anything yeah. right now You have to share screen. Oh yeah, did you share it? I'm not back. Are we starting at 1.30? Yeah, 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 I'm just playing with it. I'm just okay. curious. Just since you brought up headshot and this is a technical question, um, how do I, I thought, um, I'm on my iPad and I thought I already had a headshot when I'm off camera. Where do I put that photo? Does anybody know? Uh, sometimes there are three little dots. See, I don't, because I've done it on the cell phone. Yeah, I have done it. Sometimes there are three little dots that you Before go Before you log in or after you log no, in? No. If you go into um, Zoom.us preferences, you can connect, um, you know, your pictures. You can then have it'll be across or, yeah. all devices then? Um, I don't 
think so. I think I've got different. I don't know. Because I have it shows up on my phone and on my laptop, but you can put it in as background. Isn't that where you put your photo in? That's what mm -hmm. I'm asking. I don't remember. Like, yeah, wait a minute. View. Mm -hmm. I know it depends on what I'm working on. My logo won't come up on this one, but it'll come up on my other laptop or on my cell phone. Mm. Zoom. Mm -hmm. Oh, profile. Oh, I think I must have to do it then before I log in. So profile and that's where you upload the picture. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the reason okay. we were back to the NEA, we were talking about the NEA earlier because I sent, um, you know, a research um, um, announcement out that the NEA, um, you know, had a, I don't know, a grand announcement for research. And so we were kind of talking about that and, and, and if, you know, it's a time that we would be able to try to apply for that, you know, and um, talking about how we all are I know I'm inundated with so much with having three clients and working you know and and I don't know if I want to do I mean it's a lot of work you know to get it done but you know the, you, nothing beats a failure you know but to try and submit things you know and putting our narrative out but I would like first of all for it to be shaped better you know so that you know it's people understand what we're talking about and next week I have that phone chat with our um, the, uh, artworks fund with Marcy. Oh, okay, great. You know, remember that one? Yeah. Yeah, so. When is that the one you're talking about due? March 28th. And the grant range is 10,000 is the minimum to 100,000 per proposal. And it's a matching too, right? Right. And it's it's researched through the NEA, you said? Yes. Okay. I'll look for it and send you send it to I, you. I did see an email from you. I just wasn't clear. I think that was the one. You sent it out already, right? Mm-hmm. So do you think... Um, that this is a partnership approach to research that impacts the artist's field nationally. Um, I wonder if we should have a conversation with the NEA staff person and describe who we are and what we're doing and if it's, if it's uh, something that looks good to them. I don't know how else to say that, but. Right, before putting the energy into, you know. Yeah. I agree. But I agree first that we need to shape that conversation and, and that's where our start is today um, with what Lisa is doing. Yeah. I think we could probably answer that question better at the end of the discussion with Lisa. Rhonda? Yeah. I have a shout out. I, um, the Villager, which is the community newspaper here in Beverly, ran a really great article on me. And, awesome. <laughs> and I say that because the young lady really captured everything. I had a phone interview with her. And when I read the article, she must have done some other research because she has stuff in there that I didn't even mention. So I wanted to, I'm trying to figure out how to share. I could maybe like share the uh, uh, website with the villager and then you can click on it and see the article. Will that work out? You could share the link uh -huh, in chat. Yeah, I'll share that link so you can take a look at it. But I was really happy. She caught the essence and I said, oh my gosh, okay. And my sister read it and she said, oh yeah, you did do all that stuff, didn't you? <laughs> so uh, I'll share it in the link uh, so that it, it's, it's called, and I know Alpha would like this, it's called From Bronzeville to Beverly. 
an artist, or something about an artist inspiration. Let's see how, but it talks about my beginning, you know, where I was born in Bronzeville and how that affected my art. Uh, let's see if I can just quickly read the title, but it's a really great title. So, oh, it's called From Bronzeville to Beverly, One Artist's Black History Inspiration. Well, cool, cool. Yeah. Congratulations. Wow. So Rhonda, what is your favorite doll that you've made? Your all-time favorite? Oh, gosh. Because uh, all of them are close to my heart because they represent people that I know. I guess my favorite would probably, I'd have to say Barbara Ann because she's fashioned after my mom. And the backstory behind that is that she's a chocolate girl with great aspirations in the 40s when there was no opportunities for a young black girl in the 40s. So that's like the essence of her story. And uh, I, I, I display her, I've done like maybe five different dolls of her in different outfits. And uh, the last one I did, I sort of made it after the young lady of course, I don't remember her name. When we had the um, when we had the big thing about integrating schools, and you know, the young lady walking with her books in hand, uh, I have the name of that. But I guess that would be my favorite. That's my favorite one. Yes, I, I have like her, um, Black yeah. Panther. Yeah, the Black Panther. And then the other one who is the blackest, beautiful, light-skinned doll with light hair, but she's black. You know, she got this great big old afro. So that one's cute too. <laughs> so I have a, a, all of them are close to my heart. The, mo the most recent one I did was, uh, his name is TJ. And he's actually, what I'm saying is the last of the series. And he represents a person that came up during the migration, Great Migration at a later time period in the mm -hmm. early 70s and how he got a job and you know how he has now home in Chatham and what have you. So he's my latest one. And I have him on display at the, at the uh, Artist Consortium here in Beverly. So yeah. That girl's name was Ruby, right? Ruby something? Yes, yes, yes. And you see a lot of depictions of her. That was the Norman Rockwell picture, wasn't it? With the girls uh, trailing behind. I don't know. This is the one know. where this is the one where she was going to school, and that's when right. she, she, she was in high school. Yeah, they had the dogs. I think that was Norman Rockwell. That was Norman Rockwell that did the cup photo, yeah. the okay. picture one time. So I have my own version of Ruby. So. Bridget. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to put the link in now. Well, thank you for sharing that. Cool. Congratulations. Thank you. So I know we have two minutes. Um, I got a call from Colorado um, to be a keynote speaker at a um, the Black is Beautiful festival that will be happening in September you know, during Labor Day weekend. So uh, I was kind of uh, honored <laughs> and um, that I would be asked to be a keynote and, and talk about my trajectory of being an artist and doing an artist run project. So looking forward to that. Congrats on that. Congrats. What's the organization you said? I'll give you guys more detail, but it's part of the, uh, it's a festival that they give every year and it's a Black is Beautiful festival. Well, let me say, I was thinking this while working on all the myriad of things we have in the mix right now. Um, and we just have to remember, because when we're in the company of each other, it's easy to kind of plateau our minds, but we are here together because we're thought leaders. <laughs> and that's not, an arrogant statement. That's just the truth, I think. 
Okay, come on, receive it, breathe it in now. I was breathe like, it. okay. <laughs> breathe it in, take it in, take it in. Uh, so so Alpha, you. will it be in Denver? It, well, no, I'm looking up. Colorado actual, Springs? Yeah, um, I'm looking it up and I'm just looking at the time at 2.30. I didn't want, I want to be conscious of the time and I'll announce that at the end and give you guys the information on it. Okay, thank you, congrats. Congratulations. Let me thank take my hand down now. <laughs> So we'll turn it over to Lisa. Can I, wait a minute, can I share? You should be able to share. Wait a minute, let me do it right. Share screen. Oh, where did I put it somewhere? Put it down here. Oh shoot, I had it. Oh, oh where are you? There we go. Okay, from slide. Okay, slide to current slide. So can you all see that? No. Okay, because I hit share slide, share. You have to share screen. The okay, green. gotcha. Oh, now I got it. Okay, now let's go back to pull it up. Uh, slideshow from slide. So can you see it now? You have to um, push share screen. Oh, I did. Did you? Um, no, we can't see anything. Liza, can you tech support? Yep. What do you need? Share screen. And then I went to, oh, to share screen. Let me make sure. One participant, one participant. Okay, so share are the time. you, you are co-host. So can, if you share at the bottom, the green button at the oh, bottom. Oh yeah, no, I've hit it a couple times, but. And uh, it's just not allowing you to share? It says one person can share at a time, but let's see. Why well, need to. See, uh, I don't think what Talver is doing, and I don't think she's sharing. She's in the room on her own. There we go. You got it. Okay. Okay, from slide. Da, 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 da. Slide show from slide. Okay. What I did was just briefly summarize the uh, video that was, uh, I'll just say this is Lisa McDonald, and I want to thank the Black Metropolis Research Cons Consortium with their grant from the Mellon Foundation for providing such insightful information and detailed information. I shared all their notes, handouts, and presentations with the Google Drive, and you all should be able to access that. And from time to time, depending on how technical I am, I'm, I will play some video excerpts, but I thought it was an excellent way to begin the discussion in terms of the basics of archives, archiving, and some of the questions that I have for you all, since you all are trying to merge four different, one, two, three, four, four different art processes together in terms of the research that you've done. And this is aimed at mainly the four of you who are working on it. And one of the things is basically to do a brief definition of archiving is that archival materials are unique and preserved for their continued value. They are arranged and described according to the creator's original order and the context of the materials creation. And throughout the uh, video, they kept saying, whatever order you have is what you want to build upon because a lot of times people fail because they try to redo everything else and to sort of keep it simple. And I'll go over a few more of those that they shared. And so in terms of creating a collective development policy, I want to switch over to one of the videos that they did 
in terms of collection development policy. And then the, on the right are the questions that I've got for you all to discuss. And it's an open discussion to just sort of brainstorm. And let's see, escape. And so I'm playing with a whole bunch of stuff. So let's just hope it works. Okay, let's be. Can you all see that? It should be creating a collection policy. Does that show up? I only see you. I don't see the actual screen. You know what? When you shared your screen, uh -huh. you probably only selected one window. You probably okay. want to select your whole desktop. Then we'll see whatever's on the desktop of your computer. Okay. So no, you might it, says, it says exit full screen. So let's see. Well, full screen is different. Okay. So what you do may, I need to do now? You, you may want to, when you tried to when you were attempting to share in the beginning it gave you options like do you want to show this 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 or okay. this you want to pick the one that says desktop okay it says share screen, screen. Mm -hmm. yes oh, has my taxes and everything else that shows up but wait a minute it doesn't say dex i don't see the desktop you don't what are the options it's giving you share uh advanced basic advanced files then on the bottom, share sound, optimize for video clip. No, no, no. no. There, it lies of, that you might be needed here because I think I just might take her down a rabbit hole. Because whatever you did to show us what you what we could see, which were okay. all the file names. Yeah. Um, you, let me just let me yeah, try and see if it happens again, and then share okay. sound. Optimize for video clip and just see, because I think it's, imp oh, okay, let's see. Can you see that? We only nope. see. Let me see, okay. Well, I can go and tell you basically what it says, because that's why I did the PowerPoint in case I messed it up. Okay, so do you need Liza to uh, share That's screen? okay. What do you need? Back. Eliza, we were trying to, I was trying to show a video. Okay, there it is. Now it's up. It is? Yes. Okay. Uh, the the PowerPoint's up, but the video's not up, is it? Oh, you can't share both at the same time unless okay. they're one document, one screen. Stop share. So I have to stop share, then go. Let's try it. Yes, again. exactly. Okay. Unless you give us the link. And we ourselves have two screens open. Okay, I can give you the link. So if everybody wants to uh, have the link to the PowerPoint, we can open that up and then you can screen share the video. Oh, okay. Uh, but the link would have had to be in Google Drive as opposed to on my desktop, right? Yes. Um, yeah. If you want to take it a moment um, while you're sharing the video to, unless you need to speak during the video. Um, take a moment but I'm going to... off and on. The video may be two minutes and then we go back. So it's, you know, is what? it the I... present? It can take. Okay. And we are at 7.31. And then we'll we see. We can't see it. You can't see it? Series level and item level. I'm talking about this chart right here. You have to go back to share screen. Let's see. I want you to cut off. Then we go back to Zoom. Yes. Thank you. Okay, go ahead, Lisa. And so what we're recording is a presentation done by the Black Metropolis Research Center. And so one of the things that they felt on was they uh, looked at was how do you create a collection development policy? because it helps you decide which items to keep. And so I'm just gonna let her run for about one minute. And then that's when we're gonna go back to the discussion from the PowerPoint. And there's some questions that I had for you all. Well, in the beginning of your process is collect, creating a collection development policy, because this can help you decide which items you wanna keep. Typically, these are very simple statements that talk about the scope of your collection, so what you already know that you have, the scope of collections in your community. If you're doing a family history collection, you can even go as far as to asking your family members what kind of documents and photographs they have, so you have an idea. 
You also want to think about your collection goals, um, whether you're collecting to keep things on your own, if you're collecting to eventually make a donation, or if you want to have some other kind of transfer agreement with a repository like a library or museum, you should definitely think about that. And then you also want to think about your audience and what their needs are. Um, typically, people create collections because they want to share them with people. And so you should consider what their needs are and write that into your policy. This doesn't have to be super extensive. It can just be a couple pages, even just one page with um, these four paragraphs, but it can be really important in the long run. Okay. I have um, two slides. Would you okay. like to? And we're going to go back to the slide that talks about the collection policy. Let's see. Do I need to pull it up? Can I? It was up and you closed it. What, the collection policy, the PowerPoint? Uh huh. It was up. It was on the screen. I'm going to leave it alone. <laughs> Is it up now? No. It's just uh, you probably have it. You go ahead and share screen again. Click share screen and it'll, you'll see. Get you a thumbnail here. most likely. Here we go. Wait a minute. This has been training for you all, for me. Let's see. Share screen. There, we there go. you go. Okay. There. This is crazy. Wait a minute. Lisa, which which frame would you like? I, I'm sharing that. Number three. So, in terms of the scope of the collections, uh, and but I first started with the collection goals, and I pulled this directly from uh, Alpha and Liza, and it says the pop up research station will be a be a place to gleam information. We hope to give emerging artists and arts organizations the necessary skills to advance their creative visions. And then one of the things I added is, and we'll get into exactly who your audience is, is you also provide municipalities, communities, developers, and realtors the business case for helping artists advance their vision. And so I'm just curious as to what you think about the collection. I think that's the purpose of the collection based on that. And just your thoughts about uh, the pop up research station and how you might incorporate. Is it an accurate description? And also, how would you also add the municipalities, the communities, developers, and realtors? You know, because that's an important part in terms of some of your practices. Thoughts? Eliza, let you start that one because you work more with municipalities. Um, well, I, I mean, when I'm thinking of the purpose of my collection and what I have, uh, hang on one sec. Sorry, noise going on over here. So when I think about my collection and how that can benefit, really the history of Los Angeles, I have a time capsule view of what was happening within the arts because we invited people from all over the county to participate and they did. Lots of organizations that are no longer around that became something else. The history of downtown Los Angeles as is developed through the arts, which is one of the biggest success stories. It's also one of the biggest gentrification problem stories. So there's a lot of interest around that and the, and the genuine role that it played supporting communities and displacing communities um, is, is very relevant. Um, and that's how I, I, when I think about who might be interested in, in having that, I haven't thought too in depth. Do you have more thoughts on that, Alpha? Sure. Um, I um, start being involved with the Phantom Galleries 
when I was in Sacramento, California, and I was working at the Metropolitan Arts Commission and, and also um, interfacing with Uptown uh, Chamber of Commerce uh, in the Del Paso uh, community. And um, so cause my segue in or the way I intersected in is like three different ways from the municipality level to an artist level that ran an artist run development project um, on in the Del Paso community where they hosted the Phantom Gallery. So I had these different ways that I came in and intersected into doing pop ups, you know, and so when I'm doing my case study, I'm looking at the co different communities that I went in and out of um, as I was um, working um, on my collection. My collection is a collection of stories um, and, and artists talking about their experiences in putting and being part of a pop-up movement, you know, with coming in and working with realtors working with urban development working with the chambers and bringing art and business you know and then the place making so i had all those things that were going on as undercurrents for how i launched you know and, and worked with uh the phantom galleries in you know del paso which is in sacramento california and so so that's my entry in although i was doing pop-ups but being part of the whole movement where you're coming in and it's a whole art walk that's happening once, you know, a month, you know, and then to see it flourish. Um, and then go over and, and be one of the businesses that sits on the chamber to help develop that. And then on a municipality level, help fund that, right? So, so I don't know, my conversations in my collections, you know, um, you know, they kind of, they're broad. They, they go in those different, you know, um, areas. My collection of um, interviews is much smaller than Alpha's, but all supports exactly what she has done in that vein. And um, a lot of the private stories that I may be able to recount um, with specific incidences as well. And so, Alpha, I'm going to transcribe what you just said so you have it. That was really great. Wait a minute, let me unlock, unmute me. Thank you. Do you think that description is accurate? that's up there. The pop-up station will be a place to gleam information. We hope to give emerging artists and art organizers the necessary skills to advance their creative vision. But you also have the funding side in terms of people that support or give the funds or the space. So how would you incorporate that? Because that's what you're also covering. When I look at the toolkit, you know, in terms of that San Francisco did, those were some of the factors in there. So that's what, I, what I'm curious about is should, does art organizers, because it's more than just art organizers that you're given, you're doing, you're looking at both the municipalities, the business side in terms of helping them to persuade them that it is a, it, and it, it's, it's good, it's good business for them to support the pop-up station. Just thoughts. I have a thought. Um, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, I would suggest that those two be split out. You're talking about the artists and artist organizations and then maybe split out the one with the municipalities, communities, you know, that's community and economic development sort of. Well, so, it's, it's there in a separate sentence. So that's why in terms of what their vision right. is. Okay. Okay. You know, while, while providing municipalities, communities, developers, and realtors, the business case for helping their, helping artists advance their vision, as well as the vision for their community that might be added. But I'm just throwing it out there because that, that was what I saw was missing when I looked at mm -hmm. the other part of what your, your documentation does. So do with the uh, when we say we hope to give emerging artists and 
the definition of emerging artists, would that also be artists that are established? I don't think, uh, so you know, is, is, emerging? I'm just throwing it out there. So Alpha, would you say that you support both? Because a lot of established artists don't have places. Exactly. And so I never really say, emer I do say emerging uh -huh. artists and art organizers the necessary okay. skills to advance their creative vision. I didn't limit it to emerging, beginning right out of high school, right out of college. You know, I, I said art organizers so mm -hmm. that it's everything in between that, because mm -hmm. you're right. A lot of professional artists, you know, that are mid-career or career artists that are not attached to a gallery want to start their own gallery practice, you know, right. and take advantage of being part of this movement, you know, of uh, uh, community development, you know, it's just a, a, like Liza did a really great interview with the Hammer Museum and they got something like, what, 200,000 Liza to just stage this huge pop-up, you know, um, and we have that it was, uh, Oh, sorry, it was $100,000, but it was you know, for three weeks work. It was done, I think, in two or three weeks. So it was $100,000 for two weeks. Mm -hmm. So that was, just, that was my yearly budget, <laughs> you know, a little bit more than that. Right. So that was my point. Instead of just saying emerging artists, could it also be, well, I don't know what the term would well, be. It's not really a point. This is what we do, and this is what we've done. And so we're not changing that to reshape it. This is the breadth of the work that we've done, and it's important to say emerging artists because the Phantom Gallery, that's my charge, and that's what I do as an art consultant, you know, is, is provide professional development like we're trying to do here, is provide professional development for artists that want to become curators and do their own art practice outside yeah. of the contemporary mainstream gallery practice you know um and so a lot of artists that come to me have i mean 20 30 years in uh, in the making of being artists but don't really want to be connected to a gallery that's going to take 50 percent you know of their commission and be you know restricted under under that so they are uh, embrace the concept of temporary exhibition, you know, and alternative exhibition is what I say on the Phantom Gallery because everyone doesn't fit into this um, this movement. They just don't, you know, they, they prefer not to. But then there's some artists that gallery practice, um, you know, that really says, I want to do some experimental work. I want to do, you know, some cutting edge pop up or explore conceptual work you know, to, you know, advance my own practice other than just the mainstream of art that's not really collected. It's not collectible, actually. You know what I mean? I don't see parts of installations being taken apart and collectors collecting that. You know, I see artists working through their conceptual thought about, you know, installation. So um, when I relaunched in, um, you know, in Chicago, that was the whole concept, you know, of pop up and introducing it into East Garfield as part of new communities program with LIST and that was funded. It was based on artists going in and working with realtors, working with LIST and opening up these storefronts and, and been working through some were actually exhibition spaces where you walk into a gallery and some were more functional spaces where they sold art, created art, uh, made um, what do you get, silk screening, did different things within the space instead of having it just sitting there empty. They used it as studio space, workspace, an exhibition, and studio, a salon space, or whatever their proposal was to me, they were able to use it. And that's what I was um, looking at as case studies along the way of each of these proposals that were, you know, and how it began, how it started, the troubleshooting that went into working with a realtor, working within the um, you know, within these districts and bringing populations out to see these temporary um, installations and then it's gone. So my question though, Alpha was, is it important given what you and Liza's practice are to include the municipalities? Because that's a major focus of 
what she has done is a second think, part. Yes, I think yes. Okay. Um, uh, I know for me in the beginning in Sacramento, it was very, it was instrumental because I was mm -hmm. working for municipality, right? And it was important to kind of legitimize the work that you're doing in the field when you're on that, on that level of community organizing, you know, and developing that, you know, and, and bringing credibility to the work that you're doing. It's very important to engage and be part of the bigger piece. Mm -hmm. I'm a part more of D case. You know what I mean? And with uh -huh. that background, the Department of Cultural Affairs is a municipality, um, new communities program, new communities, um, you know, um, lists, you know, legitimize the work that I'm doing in the field. Okay. You know, by the by funding it. Okay. But that was that was the only reason I'd suggested adding that part. And it probably can be wordsmith, but I just thought it was important to do that. Just going forward, how do these goals fit with the Near Northwest Arts Council and Space in the Gap 1920, 1999 to 2020 and the artist design the future? How does this fit when you look at your collection goals, what they might be in terms of who it benefits? Laura? Well, I think what we're trying to um, demonstrate through case studies, our models and and um, other projects that we collected, we wanted to illustrate obstacles and barriers and examples of successful projects um, to convince the city and, and foundations to listen to our point of view. And so, one of the helpful things that came along was the, the planning agency that serves um, Cook County and all the collar counties. So we're talking about suburbs and rural communities further out was um, that I could advise them in looking at case studies and they could take that information and and kind of put it through their lens of what zoning and economic development obstacles exist throughout the, sorry, Atticus is, is um, standing in the way. It was kind of talking to the municipalities who don't necessarily know who their artists are or even have an agency that re-grants to artists. And it's kind of like how to activate this sector in your community. So I was just the information provider. I didn't have an opportunity to kind of put that information on a shelf someplace that artists could find. So that's what would help us because 20 years later, we're still trying to argue for artist-directed economic development. So we got all this information, but you know, how do we how do we make it available to each other and to the larger community? Because you're at ground zero in terms of archiving, right? Uh, yeah, we got 15 boxes of information from all those years. Um, <laughs> yeah, you know, you don't put that on a website. Um, we do have training um, about how to create artist development, and we have, you know, discrete steps to make that happen through a workshop but we haven't put it out there as digital. Is the, is, the, is the goal, Lisa, to get everything digital, if I'm understanding? No, the goal is because not everything is digitized, but if you want it accessible, then it needs to be digitized. And that would be one of the principles, I think, in terms of making it available because if it wasn't digitizing, you would need a space where people would have to come and look for it. 
So I think the ultimate goal is to make it, to have it digitized. Because I think if you look at what BMRC is, says in terms of best practices, you want it accessible because, you know, who's going to manage the space, you know, and if it if it's national in scope, I think that's one of the advantages. But I think I'll throw it back at you. What is your goal in terms of how to make it accessible? Are you talking to Kayla or Laura? I'm just throwing it out to everybody. Anybody? Oh, okay. Yeah, I know that uh, Alpha is 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 digitized, but I know Laura's and Liza both have quite a bit of papers. What I I loved, um, my websites are not in order. Uh, I could do it on a website. Um, I loved Flickr. <laughs> uh, Instagram doesn't work the same way. I really don't know if there are any social medias that can. Plus, you it, a lot of the stuff that I had up on social media, the sites ended. You know, so there's no guarantee. It's very confusing to figure out. I'd love to, for it to be there. So if anybody wanted to look through the history, they could see it. But it's very confusing to figure out what the best route is, especially because it's the, I don't want the upkeep to be expensive. So I don't have any good answers yet. Because all the work that was put into archiving on these sites that no longer exists is, is painful to think that, well, in 10 years, that could just be the same case for what we use now. Does that, does that present a value for thinking about existing archives and developing partnerships with longstanding ones where that's less of a concern? I think it does present an opportunity because one of the things that comes up later is if you would, you know, in terms of transferring, if, if you want to transfer to someone to support it, I know the library association and some other people through the Mellon Foundation has a grant in terms of reaching out to connect with people in communities all over the country to make sure that there are stories that might not have been covered or that are being worked on. It's called Other People Wide Widening the Path. And there are pro probably other programs. But one of the things that uh, the BMRC says is if you're going to digitize some, you know, before you archive something, if you've got somebody in mind that might be a host or might be interested. So I think it purpose of this is two for one, how do you package it so that perhaps you find someone that will be willing to archive it. And then once you find someone that might be willing to archive it, what is their system of archiving it so that you're not reinventing the wheel. I mean, that's one approach. So that's why we're here to talk as to what makes the most sense. And I know that when I talk to uh, Dino, which, who documents Blacks on the North Shore, one of the things he says is he keeps three copies of everything on a hard drive, on a cloud, and on a portable disk so that it, it, it's there, even though most of his a lot of his documents are paper. I know he had a uh, he worked with the Smithsonian and he works with BMRC in terms of pulling that together. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the purposes is where should it go, how you want it to do, how do you want to host it based on for long longevity. Because I don't know, you don't control Instagram, so all you can do if Instagram is just probably record what you put on Instagram because the stuff disappears on Instagram. And TikTok, I, I don't know how to find the stuff that is posted on there. Sometimes Instagram will show up, but I think that's a whole nother topic. And I'll ask, and I, I can go look at that and ask them some of the things that they've done in terms of social media, which Liza just brought up. And I, I think at some point, TikTok or Instagram or any of those, they're going to be irrelevant, just like MySpace is now. Mm hmm so one of the the NEA used to collect um, models lessons learned and but that was that reflected who they funded so we're asking the NEA for research <laughs> to create kind of sharing information of a much larger community 
that's not funded by the NEA, <laughs> you know? And so art schools, business schools, I don't know that, um, I guess I'm, I'm trying to think of universities or maybe the place making kind of thought leaders right now are collecting a lot of information about um, how to organize activities like this and benefits to the community. And they have categories that make it very relevant for rural communities, small municipalities, foundations, and artists who want to create these programs and what they're looking for is is kind of business models or an example of relationships or who funds it or how much does it cost and how to ask for it or how does it relate to workforce development and jobs um, i have to think there was a, a group up in Canada that was doing economic development workshops for small communities, rural communities. And so they had two or three, they had an artist and a woman who put arts economic impact kind of projects together, talking about the benefits of creating jobs in your community. And so there were very few artists participating in the workshop. It was all small government, small business chambers from small uh, communities. And so when we talk about categories of information, it's kind of like if we're looking at municipalities and arts economic impact um, thought leaders, we wanna think about where do they go now for information? So maybe placemaking is an ally. I don't know. Where do you think people have been going in the past for information? Where did you go for information in terms of resources that you found helpful or did you have to reinvent the wheel? And I'm throwing that out to everybody. Yeah. Just tracking down artists who did the work, finding mm -hmm. out who they worked with lo locally, how did they fund and finance it. There were a lot of books published in the early 90s about arts development. And so this was pre-internet. So now it's available on internet, but you can, you can, track projects and people and even look at them 10, 15, 20 years later and find out how this work out for you. Did you, you know, did it grow into something bigger or did property taxes eliminate the artist's ownership? Um, so now it's, it's easier to kind of just Google people and projects. Journalists who write about these things seem to be um, kind of particular experts in that field and they know where to go to find others. So sometimes I feel like a chicken in the barnyard kind of going after worms and corn kernels. <laughs> Is there anybody you think that has Given all five, you got four different five, one, two, three, four, five different groups, you all in terms of merging or looking at your records from different perspectives, is there, who would you say, because you talked about the journalists, is there any place or repository where you go that has that information? That exists right now that has all that information in one place? Mm -mm. Okay. Alpha? I'm going to look at my file um, for it, but it's 
Um, I was looking at the one that New York did in their storefronts for five years and um, it's landing on their website. It's the one that we applied for for the um, uh, let's see what's the name of that. Um, what I was going to say before you ask this question mm -hmm. <laughs> was that Kayla, you're over there with the wild yams in what's her name, Clotilde? Clotilde? Oh, you mean uh, Wisdom? Oh, you're over talking there. about Clemens Clemenstein. I'm not. I'm not an. I'm an alumni now. I'm not an active part of the cohort. Um, with in residence, like those of us who are in the last cohort are just. Um, mm -hmm. We're not in the space anymore. But what what's your question about Clemenstein? My question is, when I was over there, she was talking about you are a graduate and you attended the School of the Art Institute, right? Yes. Yeah. So she was saying that we should be all over that and, and making sure that they are, um, we're archiving the work that we're doing in the field because we're alumni from the university. Mm hmm Yeah. So, I, I think so, that's, yeah, I think that's very valid. Right. And then um, the other answer I'm looking for the because I have so many of these proposals that are pulled up here um, that we're applying for to be part of the um, to be part of um, can I you guys come back and I'll find I'll find okay. it because I, I didn't have it pulled up so in terms of artist design the future, how much information do you have on that in terms of the type of information? How do you see your our archive and who the audience is? Is it similar? Um, in a lot of ways, it's similar to um, uh, Near Northwest Arts Councils. However, it's a lot younger. Um, and so there's a lot less, a lot of it is digital already. Um, and some of it is um, kind of overlap with Near Northwest Arts Council. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's more, uh, it, it doesn't involve a lot of visual data like, or I'm sorry, visual art, mm -hmm. production, um, uh, archiving need. It's more planning, um, development, surveying, um, community engagement. So, I mean, there are there is some visual stuff. There's some video, there's some photos, uh, but it's it's not so that, you know, it's social practice work. So, it's not, um, the end is not to produce artwork. It's to, um, you know, it's for community development, economic development and, and engaging and supporting that on various levels. Laura, what else would you add? I would say, okay. I think artists design the future. We wanna use, we wanna kind of be cognizant of archival, we want to create a replicable model. We're looking at the future. So we don't have um, a big track record for artists design the future, but what we're designing is um, a process of artists being engaged in the planning. So it kind of covers placemaking. Um, and we want to offer up, we want to create with this archive method, a toolbox that we can share um, with the larger community. And our primary audience is artists. It's like, think about this and, and here's how you could move forward to have control over more of it. So it's, um, so we're looking to the future. We're looking at creating digital content um, 
And uh, we haven't established the table of contents yet, but it's kind of like we're tracking our work as we go along so that we can share it. Um, and it really is kind of a, a business plan for owning a mixed use building in your neighborhood that could happen in every neighborhood in Chicago and all across the country. It's just, here's, here's how you kind of negotiate what you need to know and how you work out partnerships and how you estimate costs and what can you afford and here's how you make decisions. But it's, um, it's looking forward. Okay. And, and and I would just one other piece I'd sprinkle on that is also how you engage the community and towards the the archival end of what your question is, it would it would be great also to have a framework or a system, so to speak, of best practice going forward. Because as Laura said, since it is kind of, you know, it's reaching into the future, not really archiving as much from the past like the other three entities, really what's a valuable and useful system going forward to archive what is to come? So when you talk about the School of the Art Institute, it's interesting that their video data bank is a specific media interviews with artists about their practice that they've been collecting for what, 30, 40 years? So- Longer. Yeah. So, you know, when you've got that one media to collect and that it's artists and the audience is curators, galleries, museums, other artists, arts educators, you know, they can kind of look at this broad thing and create a curriculum for their art history class. It's, um, it's a very functional model, but when we're talking about different media, it, it gets a little, we're a little bit more complicated. So maybe we need to think about, you know, categories of archive. And do you, when you say categories, do you, what I'm thinking about is even uh, kind of what's, what are maybe the top three best archiving methods or tool, maybe not the tools, but just methods, because, because you can do everything doesn't mean you should. Right. So like what not to do also. Okay, so in terms of those challenges. So basically what you said, you still will be given artists and art organizers the necessary skills to advance their creative, but you also are advancing their business, their livelihood. Or yes. does that fit within their creative vision? Yes, because mm -hmm. that's their, yeah, it's their practice. I think it's still, you mean within that first description yeah, yeah, yeah. of the top? So that fits within... At I first, so. I think so. Okay, so that. But I, I mean, I. The only thing I would say is, is it's not limited only to emerging artists, right? Which is sort of that, where Rhonda yeah. started. Mm -hmm. She's all artist at various levels, yeah, in the uh -huh. career. And then within there, there would be different levels that you could say this is for emerging art this is for all artists this is for only for emerging artists but most of it fits all artists unless they're very established which are few that have galleries representing them and are at art fairs so i want to mention repositories and um the datarts.org was funded by the nea and the carnegie mellon university or foundation, I'm not quite sure. But what they recognized was there wasn't sufficient data 
about who got funded and how much, et cetera. And so they um, created, you know, it was an arts administration project. Um, and so they looked at the field and the collection and where information comes from and how to package it and how to make it useful, how to give feedback to foundations about who they're funding um, and to small arts organizations and how they kind of land in this larger field. So it was graphically illustrated. And um, so I guess I'm thinking of a model where an arts administration, university or organization is looking at how the business skills of artists um, and, and how that information might be packaged that makes sense for, for artists to go and, and learn how to, how to, I don't know, how to create better jobs for themselves. How to be um, sustainable or to... Right. And there is an example of a non-for-profit in New York. Wages is um, kind of artist-directed collecting information. You know, it's, it's, they started kind of as a, a union or a collective or, you know, you're artists, you don't need to work for free. Marketing, that makes no sense. You can't pay your rent with mark, you know, marketing as a uh, trade-off. Um, but they just relaunched their website and they are collecting case studies about artists. And I think they have some interesting data about um, artists in a working environment. You know, it's, it's kind of like, here's a fair wage. Here's, here's a sample contract agreement. You know, it's, it's, they're attempting to kind of share information directly with artists. So they are artists directed and kind of thinking in line of consumers as artists consuming information. Here's one place to go for more information. So that might be um, a model. Yeah. So is it R-E-G-I-S? W-A-G-E-S. I can look them up and share that. I just looked it up. Oh, yesterday. wages. I was I, I, I just pulled the, I think Thank I you. just, is it, is it working artists in the greater economy? Yep. Um, in support of black liberation, abolition, and the end of racial capitalism. Does that sound right? So. New York based, yeah. Wait, we're, okay, I'll put the link in the chat. Great. Oh. I think that, I think that um, your last bullet point here are all audiences described in the vision statement. And so it sounds like we have several different uh, groups or, you know, entities that could use the information. So uh, do we need to like narrow it down to some like three different or four different, and that would make it more, you know, usable and people would know that they could go to this source for this particular information because we have described like a lot of different uses for the materials but i think they've described we've got artists and we described it's a variety of artists we've got arts organ organizers depending on which group is doing it but you're also working with municipalities communities developers and realtors to develop mm -hmm. a business case so you've got multiple audiences i think i had and i think Right now, I think they've described who their audiences are, but I think this encompasses most of them and it could be tweaked. Mm -hmm. But I think this isn't generally who they're doing, except for artists. We hope to give artists at different levels, you know, 
but that's more than the pop-up research. That's the pop-up research station, but I think it can be modified to apply to all of them. Right. And thanks, Alpha. National Historic Publications and Records Administration. Why did you put that in the chat? Alpha? In terms of that organization. It's it's loud over at Alpha. Are you coming on, Alpha? That's she in the chat because that is something that we apply for. Okay. Um, in planning. Uh huh. Yeah, implementation, but a, more of a planning. Gotcha. And there we can house and, and take all of our records and house them at a national. Uh huh. Place. And the other one that I'll put in the chat is digital, digitalizing hidden special collections and archives. Amplifying unheard voices is another um, video that we're looking at that's more, you know, national and then it's a secure, I guess, database. And here's one that might be of interest, and it was a newspaper article, but I've not researched it. But it's through the American Library Association and Library of Congress. And it's They've got a grant from the Mellon Foundation, and it's called Of the People Widening the Path, and it's best in investing in community-based documentarians who expand the library's collections with a new perspectives, fund paid internships and fellowships to engage the next generation, but basically, maybe or maybe or not, but I'll look at that more before I throw that up there, but thank you. So let's go to the next slide because I think we're pretty much in agreement of who you all are serving. I don't think we need to, and the, those who are applying can micromanage it, but I think, you know, tweak it, but I think it, it's there and we can move on because we could stay forever in terms of who the audiences are. And so in terms of, and one of the things is in terms of, I looked at, and this was from basically the resource kit for the tool uh toolkit san francisco arts commission and this is what okay saic thanks alpha and this is what alpha what the pop-up gallery put in as to what the benefits are and that's just more expansion of the things you provide and it was just for information purposes because you're basically providing some of the same things that the toolkit uh, provides and i think alpha is that not correct alpha and liza that's not if that's correct is that's what you asked for a lot of times ask questions a lot of times based on who you were interviewing is that a correct interpretation because you asked a lot of those questions and you had that information depending on who your audience is yeah yes Okay, and that was why, because that was just a summary, because that was one of the things, what kind of information is in the pop, and I thought that was a great summary of it. Let's go to, and you all, she sent that to all of you, so you all have that, and there there was more, and let's see. Can we flip to the next one, because we don't need to spend time on that one. Was this all sent in the same email? No, this was sent, remember, in terms of, uh, she sent, I'll tell you where it's located. It's located in pop-up research station talking points toolkit. And she sent that about a month ago. Is that not right? It's, and it's what's used where she talked about, you know, public think tank and she summarized basically, and Alpha, you can tell more about it, where it was a presentation that she gave. Yeah, this, was on, um, this is on a YouTube when we did the lecture for Evanston Art um, Center and uh, Liza and I did a, part of the lecture series. So that was all of that documentation that I sent and we also have the recording of that on our YouTube channel with pop-up research station. So it's kind of like breaking down the areas when Liza and I first began brainstorming and talking about the areas of research that we wanted to collect data. These are, you know, some of the, you know, areas that we wanted to focus on. 
So you might want to go back to the next slide, but that's where that showed up. And that was just to show the depth that you all have in terms of better explaining it. Because I keep saying, what's in the pop-up research? But that one explained it pretty well to me. You know, if you're a city entity, this is what we talk about. If you're a property owner and if you're an artist. And just some of the questions they have with temporary art exhibits because i think one of the things that uh both alpha and eliza said is no need in reinventing the wheel with the resource toolkit but i think it's helped direct what they ask when they do the interviewing but you all can speak up alpha do you want to yeah, say we also have this on the i have it on the phantom gallery blog um, so that when artists or anyone that's looking and doing research to find out what to do, instead of them having to go to San Francisco, it's on the Phantom Gallery blog. So I think it's basically self-explanatory when you go down. And so these are all of the, they got something like a $50,000 uh, grant to start their toolkit, you know, and use it as a resource. And then they were able to give artists, you know, a stipend to go into the, um, and begin the gallery work. Um, but these are the questions that they were asking and they, the list that San Francisco put together. Are they still using it? I don't know. But what we do is we just make sure that we post it as resource information. Okay. Thank you. Let's go to the next slide real quick because it's like 2.37. So we're going to motor. I don't know how to do it. Okay, and so these are these are questions that uh, the research center asked in terms of collection appraisal process questions. So who are your audiences? And we've talked about that. And so that's basically, I think, a little more detailed list. But that is, but they're covered within the areas that are listed as the pop up administration. You know, with the pop up uh, mission. Is there anybody else that is missing? Wait, we got artists. Who are your audiences? Art students, artists. That's interesting. Artists need to be added to that because they say art students. Artists need need to be added to number two, but that's about it. Is there anything else missing, or is there anything that's overstated when you think about your archives? Well, we haven't added, well, um, go ahead, but we haven't added, um, like Kayla was speaking to the future. Uh -huh. the uh, we're looking at, you know, the past and archiving what the work that's already been done in the field. But uh -huh. I think that now we need to add the future present, you know, our present future and what that outcome is going to be and who that audience is, which is not on here. Okay, but artists aren't on there either. So, All right. <laughs> so that they number two would be, they probably deserve their own. Yeah, you know, who are your audience is artists because I think those are the two. All of you all are serving in some way, shape, or form. And so, in terms of present, future, that. Talk about does this collection have information about a time period, place, a group of people that are un under documented? So you all, three of you focus on the past, and then one of you focuses on the future. So you could do both the past and the present where that might be asked. And those are just questions to ask yourself if you're setting up for a grant that might be helpful. But the other question I had is, do you find that these groups are under documented? And does anybody else document? Nobody else really duplicate. Does anyone duplicate the work that you have done in the past or the future? I think that work has been duplicated all over the all over all over the nation. I OK, know I was looking at that one case study um, under the uh, national um, historical publications and the group of storefronts in New York, New York 
they were funded for only five years of research of the pop-up as a storefront uh, projects that happened. Um, you know, and it took them like five years to actually pull all that information together. Mm -hmm. And it was just from one period of time, like 1987, you know, to 90 or something like that. And I'm, I'm just saying it because I don't have it in front of me to, uh, and, and when I'll go offline and I'll post it in the chat, the years that they actually were looking at and qualifying their, uh, quantifying their like research and what happened during that period of time. So I'm going to go on mute. And so somebody else can answer that, <laughs> that question while I pull up that. But the markets, is there anybody else in this market that has documented, in the markets that you cover that have documented that information? Good question. I, I know that, um, good question. You know, I think that um, like organizations like um, the Loop Alliance, you know, would archive theirs and they have a, I guess it all comes down to funding and who has it, but they funded it. I think that I know that um, New Communities Program, you know, they took all these case studies and proposals and they documented those um, as part of, um, you know, like under the, in those task force and putting those publications together, they had to document what was going on and the outcomes, you know, of these projects when you're, you know, submitting your, um, you know, your annual reports back to them of what is accomplished. So they gathered and gleaned, gleaned that information. Um, I just think that that's only the ones that I know of so far that have gathered this information, especially about pop-ups. Okay. Um, scoreboard is another one um, that has gathered all this information. Where is the information retained for those organizations? within their database, but I, I'm going to look back at the, um, what I was saying about the national, um, historic publications and records. Mm -hmm. I know that art slant, uh, the Phantom Gallery was part of that for 12 years and theirs now is published and archived under the national historic publications and records in DC. So I and would that's... say, I would say some of our collection has been, done and then then the bigger picture connected to what they did and what they collected and then another um i think more recent you know um like for example gally gashard all of the work that they're doing in this last and during the pandemic with um featuring artists that's mm -hmm. being all part of a national archive And who's ever connected to that within the art district is it's being archived. Okay, thank you. But of course, a lot of the work is under documented, and that's what we say right here. Okay. In terms of the individuals and the groups you're serving. Okay. Yes. Liza, you were going to say something. I think I heard you sort of speak up. I have nothing additional, just some of the things are similar to what Alpha said for Phantom Galleries LA. Mm -hmm. In terms of galleries, what, what did you say, Liza? In terms, of, in terms of my organization, Phantom Galleries LA, uh -huh. we don't have anything additional to what Phantom Gallery Chicago Network has. We're just okay. in some of the similar places. Okay. Laura? Um, does the organization get your shit together and do they, um, they don't have an archive, do they? They publish books and software? 
Uh, I can speak to this very quickly. They did just change their website and we were learning what remains and what doesn't. They don't have an official archive for everything, but there is some presence that we have on there. You know, that's a, it's a small organization. I'm not sure if it changed hands. I know the person who started it wanted to sell it off because, you know, they're going towards retirement. And so I'm not really sure what the state of it is or what ended up happening, but we could try to find out. Does, does the stuff that you've already documented, does the information you've already documented with certain people, does it preclude you from also documenting it with other institutions? Not us. Okay. Yeah, not us either. I'm just saying those are repositories or places where you know, we land and come up. And I did mm -hmm. see on just a website that um, they have archived all of the blog talk radio interviews they did in the couple of years they were, um, you know, interviewing artists and organizations. Um, so it's, it's, I don't know where it goes from there, but I know they took all that information off of the blog talk radio platform and put it on their own website. You know, similar to what I did um, last year in Evanston, took the, at least 24 interviews and placed them in one location, which that's, you know, a project that I still have to do. And how many years of it since 2013, almost 10 years of taking recordings and placing them in one place. But, I, but again, in terms of collection and processing, um, you know, that part of the work has to be done first before we can start talking about where that collection goes, mm -hmm. um, Lisa. But one of the things, and the only reason why I, I asked is ideally where you would want the files to be retained is if you knew what their policy was and how they like them to be retained, that would impact how you get them together. If you've got some places in mind that you want to shop around, is how what format do they want it in so that you're not reinventing the wheel which is one of the things that is recommended mm -hmm. and so that's the only reason I, I you know i put that on there is to think in terms of future what you plan to get it there based on what some of their criteria might be in terms of shopping it around so that i mean that was why i put that there Any other thoughts or comments? Okay. You want to go to the next slide? Oh, it's 12. You're just giving us a lot to think about and a lot to contemplate. So if we're yeah. tired, that's where our minds are. Uh -huh. um, you know, of how, again, we're back to that. I know where we're going to go with this, you know, but we're still sitting here like, okay, that's a lot of work. And we know that it's a lot of work that, that it's, that we're going to undertake. And that's a good question. Um, because it, before starting this part of the research, I had to figure out what metadata was, you know what I mean? And going back to kind of research and if I'm going to talk arch archivist, um, conversation, and I'm not a trained archivist, that I have to go to that person that specializes in that and that's mm -hmm. what they do so that and I don't we were going to pull them on our team but in the meantime we know that we have to I think the only person on this on this um in the collaborative I know I have stuff that's online and digital ties but Liza is the only one that has mapping completed of her projects um which are important too um, but I, I still have to map out and consolidate all this information. Um, and then you're right, you know, to see out of the four that I listed, and I think I'm going to pretty much focus on the national, you know, publications because we do have an application in with them and hasn't been denied or, you know, a, a continue working with them for, a, um, like a planning so that they, they can help guide us, you know, through mm -hmm. the process to publicize the our work, um, and that's with the uh, NHPRC. 
and and I guess my homework is to go and see what they use and what tools they use and what how they ask people to submit you know to the archives where is Gashard stuff archived um, can I get back with you? I can talk off the top of my head. Okay, thank you. But I mean, it might be interesting to look at four places that might take the archives and what they require. Just do a, a flow chart as to how what their requirements are. Mm -hmm. I'll do that for our next for our next yeah. one. But I'm just thinking. I don't know if this has been helpful or. But I think if you look at the rest of the video, it's to me extremely informative. And I know Rhonda, uh, you are looking more on personal, but I've got a whole lot of inf I got a whole lot of information from looking at that video as to what I need to do in my own house. <laughs> you got that on the Google I'm Drive. Laughing. I'm just laughing. Yeah, I, I had a chance to look at her presentation. It was really great. It gave you a lot of things to think about mm -hmm. and, and you resources know, archiving. <laughs> point about identifying a location for archiving would be really probably one of the top things because that would, could then determine how we organize our files, you know, based on it. And, and oh, yeah, I know I had a question. How do you, how do you approach particular places like the Art Institute or the Chicago Historic or the Chicago? Chicago History Museum. What is the best, you know? I, I have no. I can give you the my grandfather's papers are with the Schomburg Center, and the reason that they got there was my aunt was a volunteer, and then when mm -hmm. she died, I just took boxes of papers, and they said, "What can I do with this?" I said, "Can we throw away those that can't save?" Because some of them were crisply thin. I said, "Do whatever you want to with it." But that was that connection. So I think each connection is different. Some of them are planned. But I think if you look at it and further on in this thing is in terms of just developing a description as to what and within there, uh, there's in there, but it's also you've got it on the Google Drive, the actual uh, Acrobat thing. They tell you how to develop a and maybe that's another exercise is to just develop a description as to what you feel your archive is going to be, how many you know records, da 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 da, but just a that could be something just to play around with in terms of describing what you, where you see it, what you see it being, and that's within here. They've got some examples in 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 this presentation that came from their presentation. Mm -hmm. But I think that's a helpful one in terms of just thinking about that. But I can't answer your question. I think, Rhonda, you have to look at. Uh, if you're from Chicago, I think uh, in terms of Black history, what's the uh, museum? The library has a oh god, what what is it? Oh, uh, Carter, Newberry, what's is it? Newberry? Is it Newberry? No, Carter G. Woodson. I think in terms of oh, they collect. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. They yeah. collect Southside, and the Newberry does, but I think it, you have to go look at what they collect and just call and ask mm -hmm. in terms of what their interests are and what makes it unique and why they might want to retain it. The Chicago yeah. Cultural Center, but this is pertaining to this right now, but that was what I was just do doing to address yours issue. Any other thoughts from your participants as to what we do, where next steps are, if this was helpful or was it just more confusion? Uh, I don't think it's confusion. I think it gives us like a, um, a roadmap for what the what we need to do and how we need to to focus mm -hmm. um and that's the whole point of you know trying to you know bring us around um to focus um <laughs> so um that's my granddaughter i'm looking through you we mentioned 60 inches from the center and how um they got a huge um grant and they're they can they collaborated with uh, Harold Washington Library downtown in that archive, you know, and collecting the voices of, you know, Chicago artists and the Chicago art scene and, and the interviews that they're doing. Um, and then also, what is it? The history makers are doing the same thing and they partnered with the library 
you know, and uh, in their digital archives. Well, the history makers got bought by the uh, Library of Congress, and so right. they they charge wow. huge money for institutions to even access their database. So that's a whole different model because they're not giving away anything. Right, right, right. But I'm just saying the, the Ooh, ones yeah. that the I makers, remember. So the history makers are their their documents and what have you are with the are with the Library of Congress. You said they're yeah they their their records are with the Library of Congress now. I think wow. if they started, uh, I remember they started mm -hmm. and they they put their collection at Harold Washington mm -hmm. Library. I had went to that you know like the inauguration of that. Um, in that partnership, so that's great that they moved on to the, and their their work is there as well. Um, but they charge because I know they sell a lot to universities. They charge for access ooh. to their repository of information. Because Northwestern has a subscription and some other institutions. That was one of part of their model. I don't understand them wholly, but I know that from just. in terms of who bought some of their, you know, access to their archives. Yeah, but it's been like 10 years ago when I went to that um, at Harold Washington. So it's just, a, you know, that's another step. And it took mm -hmm. them, what, 10 years in the making of that. So they've been out 20 years in uh, gleaning and interviewing and sending researchers out and gathering that information. So, you know, they're really grown in what they're doing. I just use that as two, those two as examples of where I saw their exhibitions or their collections when they first started a place to house them. Okay, now that is a good example. Way. Plus they were charging people to be interviewed or organizations at one point. Yeah, and in the beginning they were paying researchers to go and to fly out and they got so much money and whatever to go to those different places. Mm -hmm. in no, the they beginning. Still, yeah, they still do pay researchers. Mm -hmm. You know, they have researchers on staff, some re research. But that's a good business model, too, I guess, because mm -hmm. it has to be sustainable, right? Yeah, but a lot of people that are interviewed, their organization sometimes will pay for it, because I know when Dan and uh, Patrick, I think they interviewed both of them, only because I know that they, some uh, are paid, some pay for it, or they collect money from their friends or go out in terms of fundraising with what groups they may be involved with to fundraise. That's what some of the things they've done in the past. I'm sure they have multiple models in terms of how they raise money. One question I have is that because we're looking at California and Illinois, would that make a difference? I think that we're more than California. We're located in Illinois and in California. Uh -huh. We have a national and international um, uh, database of, of interviews of artists that we've worked with. Um, it's not just regional. Great, right. great, right. great. You know, um, Liza is in Southern California. Mm -hmm. Right. And artists design the future. It's almost like a roadmap. You're doing almost a pilot that you hope to be able to duplicate that, correct? Right. Yeah. But rather than addressing temporary situations, we're looking at long-term relationships mm -hmm. and how to inject sustainability, <laughs> affordability, uh, ownership by your neighborhood. So yeah. Yeah. Thank you. We're at the end of um, the hour and I want to thank um, Lisa, um, you know, for today's, you know, presentation and getting us thinking uh, about our next steps. And um, you can see her um we're going to record this and put it on um our youtube channel and you can go back and look through it 